Ben. My name is Benjamin Nussbaum. I'm a co-founder of Atom Rain and GraphGrid. We've been using Neo4j and Elasticsearch in production for about three years now. And we've just found that it's um, a really great pairing. Uh, my background is in enterprise software for nearly the last decade and software overall for about 20 from uh, software architecture, database architecture, infrastructure, kind of touched all of that over that period of time and really have focused in the last while about bu building large enterprise systems that can't fail and trying to bring new technologies to the enterprise um, and make them the safe enterprise choice because most enterprises tend to you know, pick an Oracle or something like that because that's the safe choice. Today what we want to talk about is how do you integrate Neo4j with Elasticsearch and why would you even want to consider doing this? Um, so the reason why I've seen it useful, and we've been doing this since Elasticsearch was version 0.9 and Neo4j was version 1.9. Um, with Elasticsearch you really have a powerful search server uh, that's built around doing text-based analysis, language analysis right out of the box. It has a very fast denormalized document store so that you can go directly to the data that you need with the indexes that you create and it gives you that capability to really take the textual base input and provide very quick results with that and considering different boostings and ranking ratings of those documents and do it very sub-second. Now Neo4j on the other hand, while it is built on Lucene, it doesn't provide a lot of those search capabilities right out of the box. But what it's really great at as a native graph database is data consistency between two nodes and the traversing multiple nodes within the graph. So you can very quickly pull out your entities and do large scale network analysis. On commodity hardware, Neo4j can do about 4 million node traversals per second per core. So you can very quickly take one entity and look at a lot of the connections that it has. It's a fully ACID compliant transactional database which guarantees the referential integrity of the data that you're storing. And once you get to your starting point in the graph, you get constant time traversals. And so we found that this pairing creates really uh, effective graph-aided search where you can utilize both the benefits of what Elasticsearch is really great at, as well as the connectedness of what Neo4j gives you in exploring the graph and the re specific relationships around the entities that you're searching. So to dive in, um, I wanted to talk just a little bit about graph basics uh, to give you an idea. Because I think, you know, search, you kind of get that it's text, it's documents, you're indexing those, you're looking at the different facets that you're interested in, and you're scoring it and bringing it back. But I found that, especially with Neo4j, there's large gaps in terms of, like, what is a graph? So we want to start by talking about that. In a graph database, you're dealing with vertices and edges, or for the layman, nodes and relationships. And so Neo4j as a native graph database um, is a difference between the rest of the graph databases out there. There are many different ways that you that graph databases have attempted to be built, you know, from a graph layer on top of an existing data store to, you know, which um, to document graph hybrids. But with Neo4j, it's a native graph database, which basically means that from the ground up, they've been building for providing optimal graph traversal where you can go from one node to the next. And so the basic components that you're dealing with in a graph are nodes, which would be the circles. They're essentially the, this, the entities. And then they get labels, which are like tags. So a node can have multiple labels. You know, in Neo4j, they're schema-free, which gives you a very flexible data model to work with. So if you have a person, not every person needs to have the same set of properties. Um, and so that lets you bring in a lot of different data types and count them as the same thing. The next thing is the relationship. The relationship is how the data entities are connected. And those are very contextually specific and provide very interesting, very interesting information about how two things are connected. So in this example, you have a person prefers some hotel and a hotel has a room available. And then the interesting thing, you know, in a graph database, relationships are basically elevated to first class citizens. They are made as important as the entities themselves. And so what you get is you have properties on both nodes and relationships. And you can very quickly start to look at a network and do analysis of that with weighted edges because you can put properties on both nodes and relationships. And then when it comes to the querying aspect of it, which um, 
it makes it easy for to get up to speed and integrate. You know, how difficult is it to query something is you know a great question whenever you're looking at different data stores and trying to integrate multiple of them. You know, put them side by side. So the query language that they use is Cipher, and essentially what you're seeing here on the right is the Cypher equivalent of the SQL join on the left. And this is basically doing a depth-based search where you're looking at a management hierarchy to say, okay, who manages who the whole way down through the tree? And so you can very quickly do that in constant time because you're not joining as you go. Um, it's a very quick overview of graph databases. I didn't want to spend too much time on it because I know this is Elasticsearch, but uh, do you guys have any questions about that? Yeah. yeah. So the, the Cypher language, um, that looks similar enough to SQL. And so like SQL, does it have like, some kind of theoretical underpinning, like relational algebra for um, SQL databases? Is there something that um, is kind of an analog of that for graph-based query? So Cypher was created um, about three year, two and a half years, three years ago. And it's a declarative pattern matching language. And so it's really meant to represent the graph. It ends up looking a lot like ASCII art, you know, where you essentially have your match statement, and then you, know, you can imagine the parentheses are kind of your node, and this is your relationship, and it's directed to some other node. And so you end up writing it in such a way that you're defining the patterns in your data that are important. And so when you work with graphs, it becomes a lot about the patterns that are important. Uh, other questions? So the point of graphs is the purpose of using this bunch of relational is so that the joins of your graphs are not the proper joins. Yeah, so, in a, so with Neo4j as a native graph database, it's they basically have use what's called index-free adjacency, which gives you constant time. So when you have your node, all the relationships coming off of it are memory pointers. So if you get to your starting point in the graph, you can go from one node to the next, and no matter how far you go or how many depths you go, if I look at my you know, first level connections and my second level connections and my third level connections and so on, each time I go out through that network, it's constant time. It does not increase based on the, how far out I need to go because it's literally just a memory pointer from one to the next. And so you start finding those patterns in your data that are important and that lets you very quickly go through the graph. And so when you're trying to enhance a search query, you can start by getting using Elasticsearch to get to that index from the, going from text to some documents that are interesting and then enhancing those with graph traversals and still bring the whole result back in a few couple hundred MS. Um, other questions? On the connection to Elasticsearch, there's a few different ways um, that this can be done. And I think you know, we'll try to camp out here a little bit and talk about this portion. Um, using Neo4j, uh, it's pretty, there's a couple different plugins that you can use to push data to Elasticsearch and build the different indexes that you're interested in and take advantage of the ability to search on that. How we've been using this for the last few years is we have a Neo4j plugin that runs on Neo4j, and that's a search in indexing plugin. And what it does is essentially whenever you know data is committed to the graph, because that's kind of the source of truth for the connected data, we need to take that and deploy it and push those data points out to Elasticsearch to keep the indexes updated. Um, and it's not only important when data is updated or changed, but especially when you remove it, because if you don't remove the data from the Elasticsearch index and you've lost that message, you've kind of lost your chance to pull it back from Elasticsearch. And if Elasticsearch is that front-facing thing that's being hit for every one of your search queries, it may start returning results that aren't there. So the post-commit hook where you're pushing data out for you know, any additional data, any deleted data, or any updates um, is very important. So essentially what happens is those, those um, <clears throat> Whenever the hook, the commit happens, it pushes out to a search ID queue uh, with RabbitMQ, and then the Neo instance pulls that pulls that back. So that we note that there was an ID that was updated. We pull it back in from Elasticsearch uh, from the queue, and then go and actually build the document that we want to store in Elasticsearch. 
to enable search against. And then once we've built that, we push it back out to run them queue. And so we have an exchange there with the search binding, and we're just passing the JSON back and forth. And then once that document is there, we use the log stash forwarder, consume from RabbitMQ, uh, the index queue, and actually bring the documents into Elasticsearch to keep them up to date. And then what you've got is essentially your web apps can go straight to graph for anything that's purely graph, or they can go to search for anything that is search. And oh, one common use case where you can see this is on find.media. Basically, whenever you're typing into the search bar, you'll see all of that's hitting Elasticsearch. And then once you've kind of gone through that autocomplete process where you're getting to, okay, these are the results, this is what I want to really hone in on, then at that point, it hits the graph to go and grab all the additional data, connected data around that result and bring back a more rich result. Any questions about this portion of it? How many, uh, how many customers do you have for, for the implementation of this project? We've done this since 2012, probably, I guess 2013, um, four times. And then in terms of people using the open source plugin, I see a lot of activity on it in the Neo4j Slack, trying to, you know, people using Neo4j with Elasticsearch. Um, so well, we've done this quite a few times. What's um, what the challenges? What's been some of the bigger challenges that you've run into? Yeah, I think some of the big challenges we've run into have been whenever we miss deletes. That was one of the kind of gotchas because if you miss a removal from the search index, so if the data changes on the graph side of things and you don't get it removed, if it's a deletion especially, and it doesn't get removed, you know, a message drops in RabbitMQ, which it'll, you know, it's all in memory occasionally, it drops messages, um, and you haven't kept track of what needs to be removed from the Elastic Search indexes, then you have search results coming back that don't go anywhere, and that's not good for anybody, and then there's not really a way to resolve that except to do a re-index, which if you have a large graph, like one of our customers has a 500, 500 million node graph, and we're indexing most of that into Elastic Search, and so you have, you know, half a billion entities in Elasticsearch that you're you know, potentially searching through. And if you need to drop an index with you know, 30 or 40 million uh, items in it and re-index it, that's going to take a while. So <laughs> that's not good for a production system. So I think that was one of the gotchas where we're you know, looking at the routing and integration and making sure that you uh, have very good durability in that so that you don't drop messages, especially on deletes, is very important. For bringing it all together with enhancing the, the one other way we can do that, and instead of having two separate calls going from the application to directly to graph or to search, we can basically connect Elasticsearch with Neo4j and have the web app always hit search first and then basically use Neo4j as a way to enhance the search result. And we'll do this by taking a user target and letting the user you know, make it more personalized. So search documents are kind of static, they're set, they're known properties. But in the graph, we, as relationships change, we can take advantage of more dynamic connections without you know, pushing it out. And so what we'll do is basically pass in a user target so that we can make the search more personalized the type of considerations that get come back. And essentially when those graph queries come back, it does a boost in the scoring of the document. So we use it in such a way to boost certain results to the top and surface them more, uh, more highly in the result set. And then this is, this is done through an Elasticsearch plugin. So instead of being done through Neo4, the Neo4j plugin, this is uh, pretty much all on the Elasticsearch side of things. And it can use the graph standalone, or it could use it with a plugin on the graph as well to return that data. Questions? Comments? Observations about this? Yeah. So do you want the Elastic node and the Neo Top. 
Yeah, so all of this integration happens over REST. So we have our you know, Elasticsearch cluster and our Neo4j cluster. All of this, um, the way we've done it is all in AWS. So basically it's all in, in a VP, VPC. And we've got kind of the web apps, Nginx punching through on 80 and 443. The web apps are the API layer. And then those, um, which we build and uh, deploy on Wildfly or Spring Boot depending on if we're doing a microservices architecture or kind of a full enterprise stack. Uh, and then from there, the, that, that API layer will integrate with search and uh, Neo4j as kind of the backing, the store, backing stores. So there's a few different ways that you guys can get started with this. Um, there's <laughs> open source, uh, Neo4j-contrib. Uh, that's basically an open source library that does Neo4j and pushes out to Elasticsearch, so it's essentially a one-way integration of taking what's in the graph and pushing it out to Elasticsearch. Um, it doesn't support relationship indexing, um, but it does nodes, properties, labels, those types of, those different pieces of metadata in the graph. And then um, another one by GraphAware is Neo4j Elasticsearch as well. And they're working on, um, they told me in the next few days, the reciprocal from Elasticsearch to Neo4j where you can use, um, basically take a query into Elasticsearch and then pass it through to Neo4j to enhance the result and boost different results based on the patterns that were found in the graph and bring those back. Um, that's available also on GitHub. And I'll distribute these slides so that you guys have them available. I'll just post it to the meetup. Link. And then, uh, as part of Graph Grid, we've done the, we basically made the Neo4j Elasticsearch auto indexing available uh, as well as part of that standard stack. If I start typing here, all of this is going to Elasticsearch, and at the, you know, at the point where it's not using autocomplete, it's basically doing a full search with each keystroke. Um, and then these are documents that have all been built and uh, scored based on you know, different popularity, whether it's from you know, IMDB or Rotten Tomatoes or you know, some of these different places that'll give you ratings and reviews um, or different ratings. And so we'll pull that up and use that to build the entire popularity of the document as well as looking at contributors that are in the movie, how popular are they, kind of bring that all together. And then as soon as you clicked on that, I clicked on that result, it made a query to Neo4j to go pull in all the connected data so that I could see, you know, where's this movie available, kind of look at all of those different sources where you could consume it, go pull in the cast and crew, go pull in and make a request to the related endpoint so that you could go get more like Gladiator, um, more directed by Ridley Scott, more starring Russell Crowe, kind of all of those and, and build that page very quickly because you essentially have within the graph you have Gladiator as that starting node and then you have everybody that, you know, all the actors and directors and other movies that are all the traits like, you know, action, sword and sandals, you know, epic, these different things that describe the movie, you know, Roman Empire, all of these things and from there you have another set of, you know, movies that you could bring back and so, um, you know, that's kind of the, the recommendation set where you can go look at what are those movies that should be brought back? Um, another one would be like uh, datenightmovies.com. Um, you know, this is basically trying to answer that question of what should we watch tonight? So if I, you know, feel like Gladiator and my wife's like, hey, let's watch The Notebook. Um, so basically, both of those, whenever I was typing, that was going to Elasticsearch. And then as soon as I clicked on that second one, at that point when it had both of those pieces of information, it passed both of those to, to Neo4j and it's brought back a result set where it took both Gladiator and the notebook, mashed them together, looked at the collective set of you know, traits and different genres and story elements that they have in common, and then looked at the possible th set of things that could be recommended on the other side of it, and then built that result set to bring back movies that we both might like. And so then you, know, you can go find a place where you can watch that and have your date night. Uh, 
so those are a couple of the implementations where we've, we've put this into production. Yes? Do the relationships stay in the new position only the nodes are doing in that? So it's some of both. Um, we, a lot of the document can be a combination of nodes and even include the context of the relationship. So if I want to be able to search on Glad, you know, if I want to create a Gladiator document that represents that node, um, you know, I may go take the Gladiator movie, go get, you know, it has its set of metadata, you know, the release year, the title, um, and then it has relationships to contributors, and a contributor could be an actor, you know, like Russell Crowe, or the director, like Ridley Scott. And then on that contributed relationship, there's a role, and so that essentially could be the that would be the character that they played in the movie for the actor. And so all of that information gets built into the document, where essentially you could so you can take that one movie and go look at you know not only you know genres. So if you're searching for a genre and you want to say, okay, well if I'm searching for Roman Empire, you know, Gladiator should probably be near the top as one of the movies based on its popularity and IMDb or, you know, these different ratings that we can pull in from different websites as well. And so that document basically pulls all of that together so that whenever you're searching, um, you can take advantage of all of that in terms of how you rank and score it. What versions are you guys on? You guys on version two yet? So we're in the process of upgrading to version two. Um, we started with nine or point nine kind of moved up through 1.4, 1.5, and um, now we're making the jump to two. So that's been a pretty big overhaul to the different plugins. Um, and just, you know, we were using the Rivers plugin initially, so that was a pretty painless integration. Um, now we're kind of moving away from that since it's been deprecated. Is there a certain size of database that you recommend? Um, so whenever we talk about data, um, you know, Neo4j, a lot of the question is uh, data complexity. It's a function of size, structure, and connectedness. And so the connectedness is really important in data complexity, especially when you're dealing in a relational or a relational world, because um, the more connected things are, the more joins you end up needing to do, or the more denormalization, and then or the more normalization and then denormalization for performance. Like you end up going through this process where you're like, okay, normalize everything, okay, bring it all back together into this hash table so that, or this view table so you can actually get a performant query result. Um, so when you have highly connected data and you want to look at all of that uh, to, without needing to do join, 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 um, it becomes much more performant to use a data graph database like Neo4j. Um, and I've just found that in terms of modeling real world problems, it represents the real world very well just because it has contextually specific relationships. You know, we're all connected to the things that we interact with every day through very specific types of relationships. And when you can model that and actually know that it's going to store it on disk in that way, uh, it's a really powerful database in that, you know, for being that source of truth. Because when it's, you know, as an ACID compliant transactional data store, it guarantees the consistency between two nodes. So if I, whenever Neo4j does a write to the database, you do pay a bit of a penalty because it locks the nodes on both sides of a relationship which is gonna be very different than, you know, if you have a graph layer put on top of a document store or put on top of a relational store. Those are, the underlying data stores there don't have the concept of locking both nodes. And so they'll only lock the node and write that one relationship. And so in a relational store or a document store with a graph layer on top of it, you can actually end up with a scenario where two nodes disagree on the relationship between them because they'll only, it's only written from one, and locked from one perspective when that write occurs. And that's why it's really important to use a native graph database like Neo4j where it guarantees that referential integrity that two nodes will always agree on the relationship between them. And so that's why we've chosen to use that instead of, and pair it with the technologies that complement it well rather than trying to just use one technology for everything in terms of the storage types.